Hello? Hello? Hello, Doc? Can you hear me? Hello, Doc? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How can I help you? Well, Doc, pardon my breathing, but I'm having a hard time with it. And with everything that's going on, people have been telling me to uh, maybe perhaps not come into the hospital and uh, give my doc a call and explain what's going on with me to see as to whether or not it'd be warranted for me to come in. I appreciate you doing that. Mask as to what your name is. And then we'll get started from there. I know these are trying times, but we'll get through all this. Doc, my name is Barney. And I live down in Florida. And uh, like I said, I need your help. So would you mind letting me know as to uh, what I should do? Well, Barney, nice to meet you. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, and once we get past this, then uh, hopefully we'll be in a better place. But if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then please answer those questions to the best of your ability. Okay, Doc. I got this. Please go ahead and answer your questions, and hopefully I'll be all right. My first question to you is, well, are you running a fever? Doc, last time I checked, well, they said that I could check my fever in two places. One, obviously, place a thermometer underneath my tongue, but then also place it underneath my axilla. In both instances, I did find a fever. The temperature, if you must know, was hovering around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Does that help? Yes, Bernie, that definitely helps. My next question to you is, are you coughing? Doc, I am coughing. Would you like to know as to uh, what my cough is like, or what it looks like, or what it sounds like? That'd be great. Let me make it easier for you. The coughing that you're having, is it productive? Or is it dry? Doc, the cough that I'm having is uh, kind of sounds like this. I don't want to exert myself too much, but <coughs> kind of dry right now. Every once in a while, I feel like something's about to come up. I well, appreciate that. My next question to you is, are you feeling tired? Are you able to walk upstairs like you normally would? If you have stairs at your home, if you walk your pet, are you able to walk your pet as usual? Doc, well, not that you mention it. I mean, I do have my dog that I take for a walk, but with everything going on, I've self-quarantined myself. But I'm telling you, even for me to walk from my bedroom this evening to the kitchen so that I can... Well, grab a beer. I'm getting tired with that itself. Goodness. All right, well, at this point, with everything that you're telling me, you're running a fever, number one. Is that fever breaking or is it consistent? Dog, that fever is constant. It doesn't seem to go away. And, uh... Well, I've had it for maybe about three days straight right now, and I cough as well. Um, like I said, with everything that I've been reading, I'm trying not to uh, be bombarded with all this news and be in a state of panic. But at the same time, I do feel fear. I know you do, as everyone does. And uh, you've made the right steps by giving me a call. And I do appreciate you answering my questions. The fact that you're running a fever, it's been about three days, as you said. 
the fact that you're coughing, and at this point it's a dry cough, but you said that you have something or you feel like something's about to come up. Number three, the fact that you're feeling really tired. The fact that you're having difficulty moving from your bedroom to your kitchen even is difficult. In other words, we call that fatigue. A couple of the questions for you that I need to ask you also is, are you having a sore throat? Do you have a headache? No, Doc, I don't have a uh, sore throat, but I do have a headache, but uh, that might also be because I'm, trying to ha I'm having a hard time with keeping up with my regimen of insulin because I have diabetes, too. I know I'm a little overweight. I've been trying to lose it. You know, my grandkids and stuff, I want to see them and I want to play with them, but, uh, you know, I'm trying. Okay. Well, at this point, the fact that you're telling me everything you are, and in addition, you have an additional disease called diabetes, I highly recommend that you come into the hospital and you tell the people when you register that you actually have called in and uh, that you have explained your symptoms and such. They pull out your file, and then after that, we'll take it from there. But the first thing is for you to uh, come in, and then from there, we need to make sure that we take care of whatever is going on with your chest. Doc, well, I appreciate everything that you're saying, and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that I'm able to come in and get your help. All right, I'll see you in a little bit. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Dr. Carlo Raj, and. What I'm walking you through here is uh, obviously COVID. Now, what does COVID mean and such? Well, we're going to go through all that. But the first thing that you're going to do when you may not be feeling well. Now, you'll notice here that our patient, Bernie, was, uh, well, not feeling well at all. In addition, he had a uh, fever. In addition, he was coughing, but the type of cough that he had was a dry cough. Now, could it be productive? Well, that's later on in the course of uh, COVID, or called SARS, COV-2. I'll tell you what all that means in a second. But the most important thing is, let's not get tripped up over the semantics. It's about making sure whether or not you need to come into the hospital, because this hospital itself has become the source of the disease. And I'll go through statistics with you. So we got to get away from thinking that, okay, well, I have to take a look at every single patient or patient-centered medicine. Move away from that to making sure that we have community-centered medicine. And that is going to be a debate that's going to be had in the time to come. But at this point, if you go to the hospital and you're not even quite sure as to whether or not it's warranted or perhaps the COVID could have been taken care of at home, then it's in your best interest not to go. Because that's where the disease is now coming in. It's an actual disease. COVID stands for coronavirus, C-O-V. I, D stands for disease. Obviously, discovered in 2019. Now, with that said, I want to immediately begin with look at our patient and tell you a little bit more. But our patient was talking about that dry cough. A patient was talking about the fact that he was having a hard time breathing and the fact that he also had a fever. Well, Bernie does come in to the hospital. It would be warranted. When he comes into the hospital, in addition, he has diabetes. Would you please take a look at his weight? He's overweight. Most likely type 2 diabetic. That is millions of Americans. Next, we're going to do a chest x-ray on this patient. We do a chest x-ray. Huh, this is what you end up finding. Goodness gracious, what's going on? What am I looking at? On the far left, there's an anterior posterior chest x-ray. And this is for you patients and then for you also docs just to get the basics. What you're looking at here 
is in the periphery. In the periphery of the chest X-ray, all the way over to the left, letter A. And that is peripheral, patchy type of location. We call this ground glass pacification. This is the right peripheral lobe, all the way from the upper, middle, and lower. Every aspect of the right lung has been affected with this cloudy, hazy appearance. On the left lower lung, you also notice here by the pleura that we have a pacification ground glass appearance. This is a chest x-ray. This is pretty typical of what you would find on a chest x-ray in a patient that has coronavirus. We'll talk more about that coronavirus. It's responsible for many types of diseases apart from what we're seeing here in 2019 end of and into 2020. Over to the right are both B and C are CTs. All right, these are CTs. The one that you're seeing here in the middle is called an axial. You don't have to get caught up on that. But the fact here, if you take a look at this on closer examination, you'll find once again ground glass appearance. And what does ground glass mean? It means that if you had a glass table and let's say that in the glass that you then spilled some, oh, let's say uh, some milk or perhaps it was filled up with sand. It gives it that ground glass appearance. And then here, once again, you'll find that on the right side, you have peripheral type of opacification called ground glass. The very far right is also CT, but this is a coronal section of your chest. So on the far right is a CT, a coronal section, and on the far left is a chest x-ray. Now, these are all imaging studies, obviously, and these are different types that will then help the doc to make sure that we are giving you the proper steps of management. Now here, once again, on the far right, you'll notice that you have areas that are cloudy. Those areas that are cloudy in medicine is then called your ground glass appearance. It's opacified. In other words, a little bit whitish. Next, as we move from here, we're going to do some other exercises that is going to help us with further explaining things. So are these normal images? Absolutely not. Right? These are absolutely not be normal images. Now, in addition, the patient is diabetic. Now, why is that so scary? It's scary because this patient who's diabetic, because of the concomitant or the simultaneous infection, will make matters worse. And in a diabetic, there is that possibility, of course, that the patient may have what's known as atherosclerosis. Now, what atherosclerosis means is blood vessel disease. That blood vessel disease can be up and down the body. Now, what we're worried about here is that if there's blood vessel, vessel disease of the heart, it is then referred to as being coronary arterial disease. During an infection such as COVID, because it's an inflammatory process, there's increased demand of the needs of blood and such to make it to those areas that have been infected. For example, the lungs, like we just said. It puts extra strain on the heart. In other words, as the blood vessel disease gets worse in the heart, the coronary arterial disease, this is what we refer to as being acute coronary syndrome. Now, that acute coronary syndrome could then become worse, and when that happens, the patient may then have issues with the heart itself and may start having symptoms of myocardial infarction. And hence, oftentimes, you'll then find that maybe perhaps he has currently experiencing myocardial infarction. Is that a possibility? Or is he experiencing exacerbation of the acute coronary syndrome? Now, that would happen first and then myocardial infarction. The point being is, you may then find a marker, which we then refer to as being troponin I. Now, that's your patient. So those are things that you want to pay attention to. Remember, I had earlier said that you want to be careful as to whether or not you either want to come into the hospital at all. In Italy, in the most expensive of hospitals, in the most affluent of communities, are the areas where people are being infected by going to the hospital. 
So in other words, ask yourself, do I panic and get scared? Am I just looking for that test because I can go get everyone else sick? You could be asymptomatic. In fact, 80%, 80% of what we know about COVID, asymptomatic. You could be a carrier and you might not even know it. Asymptomatic. You go into a hospital, you walk into a social setting, you're passing it on to someone else who's immunocompromised, such as Bernie. I say immunocompromised because he's diabetic, he's obese, and maybe he has some autoimmune diseases and immunodeficiency. So you were asymptomatic, but you were so hell bent on getting your test that you passed on your virus to our lovely fr friend who's not properly equipped with dealing with the disease. Guess what happens? He or she has a heart attack. He or she will die of perhaps lung disease because now the disease has progressed into a secondary infection, maybe a sepsis. You don't wanna do that. That's on your clock. That's on your hands. So it's not in your best interest. Now what I'm showing you here is Madrid, Spain. This was a convention center in Madrid. The whole thing is turned into an infirmary, infirmary waiting for its first batch of patients to come in. This sounds like a concentration camp, but this is all done by our lovely friend, named by WHO, World Health Organization, Coronavirus Disease 2019, that was discovered in December, and we'll talk about more about how it was spread. Most likely a bat, another one that kind of falls into it is a species called a pangolin. Amazing, a pangolin, so cute. But the way in which we've treated animals is the fact that the virus, a coronavirus, which comes under, we'll talk more about coronaviridae and such. There's a bunch of coronaviruses. And in the past, you've heard of SARS, and that came from an Asian civet cat that then mingled with the bat that then released SARS version 1 that was back in 2002-2003 next the bat yeah, an unbelievable reservoir for viruses because of its resiliency then maybe perhaps the theory maybe nothing's confirmed yet because we're still learning that with the pangolin maybe in Central Africa where you hunt for these things it's an only mammal that has scales on it and I'll show you what that looks like in a second, perhaps. But that mutated, underwent recombination, or different ways in which these viruses will then mutate. Recombination is the theory, perhaps, once again, most popular. Not yet confirmed, but most likely recombined. And a zoonotic disease, which literally jumped from an animal and got to us humans. Think about that. And we're all in our rooms thinking about, well, how did we behave today? This is Berlin, the streets of not a single soul. This is India a couple days ago. Mumbai, not a single soul. You know the pictures. Now, under what's known as the International Committee or Commission of, uh, on tex Taxonomy of Viruses. So you got WHO. And then semantics is what I'm trying to get at. Another name for COVID is called SARS, version 2. Version 2. SARS, version 1. In other words, severe acute respiratory syndrome. Coronavirus, also, back in 2002, 2003, was that Asian civet, a civet cat. The same civet cat, or type, or species of, in which if it eats a certain berry, and it poops, literally when it poops, it makes his coffee Okay, Lopikowak. Anyhow, point being is when it gets infected, it then results in SARS version 1. Years down the road now, 2019, we're talking about bats again, perhaps being the most common or the likely source. Still hasn't been confirmed, but we're still trying to figure that out. That along with the pangolin ended up developing SARS version 2, which we call COVID 19. Same name, so do not get confused. That's all that I wish to say about that. Formerly known as novel. Novel meaning a new type, a strain of coronavirus. 
All right, here's the uh, family and so on and so forth. Those of you are interested in taxonomy, you may have a bunch of people in this generation that may actually then get into virology because of everything that's going on. It's a fascinating, fascinating topic and a study. Let's talk about epidemiology real quick. Mortality rate, 2 to 3%, still working on that. Obviously, it's still changing. Mortality rate, look at this, approximately 330,000. It's rising every single day. In the U.S., the cases include approximately 31,000. That's rising. States of emergency, as President Trump has called for the state of Washington and the state of New York as being places of emergencies. California is still being debated upon. But 31,000 cases. We have approximately 400 deaths in the U.S. A lot of those deaths, once again, I repeat, are those Elderly individuals that we saw with our patient, Bernie. Comorbidities and underlying issues such as a heart disease, maybe hypertension, maybe diabetes. And with the concomitant or simultaneous infection, may then have exacerbated the issue. And then therefore, the patient dies of maybe sepsis, infection, multi-organ failure, lungs, heart, kidney. Are you getting it? UK is fastly catching up. It's going to overwhelm them system. They're going to catch up with Italy. This is not a race. We're trying to prevent. We're, we're just, we, we're having a hard time containing it. France, Spain, I just showed you beds there. Italy, close to 800 deaths, and that's rising every single day. China has plateaued at this point. And then we have Iran as well. Now, what does RO mean? It basically means this. In epidemiology, it means that me as an individual, if I had COVID, how many people on average would I then spread it to? Approximately two, maybe up to three, depending as to which country. Depending as to which country. Most of the individuals that are getting sick, asymptomatic individuals going to the hospital, wanting to get tested, and in that place, or then walking or behaving as if everything's okay, gathering together, even up to two people. How do you spread it? Person to person, up to, up to two meters, that's six feet. That means that this little virus, it's an RNA virus, single stranded positive sense. If you want to know more, you take a look at all that. Positive sense, that's dangerous. That means that this RNA can immediately, positively, create its own messenger RNA, create its own proteins so that it can proliferate. Now, this SARS version 1 or two, excuse me, is a heck of a lot more dangerous than SARS version 1 because of its increased affinity to what we'll talk about as ACE2 receptors, angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 receptors located in the alveolar epithelium in abundance. And this thing has 10 to 20 times greater affinity, version 2, COVID does, than does SARS version 1, and hence the respiratory issues. How does it get there? I have it. I'm asymptomatic, though. I'm not showing any symptoms. I'm not showing the fever. I'm not showing the dry cough. Maybe a little bit. I'm not showing the headache. I'm not showing, I'm not showing the fatigue and such. Well, when I'm talking to someone, out of my mouth comes out these respiratory droplets. These respiratory droplets are like hot air balloons for the virus. It may travel, travel, travel like hot air balloons for six feet, ladies and gentlemen. Six feet. That is a long way. That is a long way for it to travel. That's amazing. Two meters. Respiratory droplets. Now, could it be aerosol? Sure. How long could it last in that hot air balloon? That respiratory droplet. Up to, up to three hours. Up to three hours. Let's talk a little bit more. So where does it come from? Didn't come from a lab. It did not come from a lab. Any conspiracy or any conspiracy theories out there? Let it go. It did not come from a lab. It came from an animal. It's a zoonotic disease. It came from a wet market. By wet market, what do we refer to? Well, in China, the Wuhan city, you have, and I apologize for my mispronunciation, who went in the seafood market. It was a mess complete wildlife, all kinds of, apart from obviously seafood, you have all kinds of animals there. Could there have been a bat? Could there have been a pangolin? Could there have been recombination of viruses? In other words, perfect harborization 
an environment for these viruses to have a pate. And they got together and they recombined and created a whole new progeny that literally jumped from an animal to us humans. And now we're passing it from human to human to human to human to human. 330,000 at least. 14,000 deaths at least. So zoonotic researchers talked about the animals and such. Now, I told you earlier as to uh, what kind of issue was it. In that particular market, when the viruses got together, most likely it were combined. In other words, the genes recombined and then they formed a particular strain which is then affecting us humans. How does it get? How does it work? I'll walk you through that in great detail. The reason that's important is because those of you that are interested in developing vaccines... It's important for us to take a look at the structure and anatomy of the virus so that you know as to, well, what parts of the virus do I wish to then target, right? Well, we're going to take a look at that. We're going to encompass everything as much as we can in the next, well, little bit. Other viral genetics that you'll have to know include the following. Reassortment, big time. Back in 2009, we had a pandemic called H1N1 influenza virus. That thing, goodness gracious, goodness gracious, <laughs> went through a reassortment gene of human, swine, and avian reassortment. I mean, you talk about these being pseudo-alive. In other words, they're not quite alive, but I mean, they're pretty ingenious, aren't they? That's a particular viral genetic in which it's called reassor reassortment. It could be complementation. In other words, one virus will use another. Or it could be what's known as your phenotypic type of reassortment. Our focus will be recombination, seems to be the theory in which these viruses have now spread from the animal to the human. Now, SARS version 1, SARS version 2. I get it. SARS version 1, animal civet bat as being a com common, common reservoir for the virus. Amazing, these bats, huh? Amazing. When's the last time you want to hang out with a bat? Well, that's on your own time. Be safe. We had another type of coronavirus that arose from the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia and such. Perhaps a camel. And that was called MERS. That was a coronavirus, Dr. Raj. Yes, it was. It was a coronavirus. A different species called MERS. Middle East. Respiratory syndrome, MERS, but it was a coronavirus. That was back in, well, 2012. We just talked about the animal civet. There it is. You see that cute little thing right there, the bottom right? And then up on top is something called rhino folus type of bat. There's different species, obviously, of bats themselves. The one that we're targeting is called rhino, R-H-I-N-O, nose, folus. If you want to know more about bats... Well, that's something that you want to focus upon. When these two got together, it created SARS version 1. Look at this. SARS version 1. Severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. Now, here's the thing. The one on the left is a cartoon schematic trying to be cute during these times. Pangolin on the left. A scaled mammal. Skinned and killed. And the scales highly prized by certain communities. During the killing of the pangolin was a virus that may have then been released along with the bat. Once again, a rhinophilus giving us our current SARS, the version 2, also known as COVID-2019. Hopefully, this stuff is making sense to you. It's coming together. And no longer are you feeling so ignorant. No longer are you feeling so confused. Now, take care of yourself, though. So, what are the differences? Quickly here. The common cold. Please know, there's plenty of coronaviruses, plenty. It's like 50 different species, huh? 50 different. Of those, I've just walked you through well, a couple animal ones, huh? I walked you through the civet, I walked you through the animal, uh, camel, and I just walked you through another bat, which we have today. So, then we have SARS, and then we have sars cov So, this is a table to compare the different types of coronaviruses in which how it affects us. Every year we have common cold. We all get it. We all get it, but we don't panic. The incubation period there is three days. 
in Bernie, that cough, our patient, Bernie, that cough and such, he had it for how long, that fever? He said about three days. Hmm. Well, could it be the common cold? Perhaps. But it could also be SARS. It could also be the SARS version 2, the COVID. But look at the time frame for version 2 or COVID. 2 to 14 days. 2 weeks. So in other words, if it's been a week since your symptoms first appeared, and you don't have anything else going on, your fever's gone, you did not use antipyretic, in other words, fever-reducing agents. One week after symptoms, and the fever is gone, the cough is gone, you're probably home free. There's a little bit of debate as to whether or not NSAIDs, a couple of French doctors have noted that NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, aspirin, NSAIDs, may cause the COVID to become worse. It's anecdotal notes. In the U.S., if we find that we have to administer, we have to give NSAIDs, then we will. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but keep that in the back of your head. I know theories are flying out there because we're still learning about the virus. It's quite different from the others. Paracetamol or acetaminophen or Tylenol is something that would reduce the fever and has not shown to cause worsening of the infection. It's the difference between Tylenol. Please don't drink your Tylenol. It will cause liver damage. You don't want that. So always refer to a doctor or a proper professional who's in the healthcare field for proper dosages. So be careful. Just because people are saying something, don't go crazy. Next. Well, common cold, pretty much complete resolution. Right? It goes away. But SARS, though, as I said, ACL symptoms. That's 80% of your population. It's a little bit different if it's SARS version 1, but I'm not going to cover this. We're focused on our current issue. Asymptomatic. So what does that mean? You still quarantine yourself. Do not pass this virus on to people that don't deserve it, especially the people that are struggling with, let's say, autoimmune diseases. What, am, what do I mean by autoimmune diseases? You've heard of rheumatoid arthritis. You've heard of lupus. These are all very common autoimmune diseases. These individuals have a handicap with their immune system. Symptomatic individual passes create and go into severe infection. Our patient, Bernie, had a hard time walking from the bedroom to the kitchen. That is shortness of breath. SOB. Shortness of breath. He's not an SOB. He has shortness of breath. Maybe perhaps chest pain. Troponin. Cardiac markers. Remember, the heart may then be exacerbated. By that, I mean it might then become stressed. So, therefore, any underlying issue become worse because of the demands of the infection. And then it may then go into worst case scenario, critically ill. We're talking about multi organ failure, sepsis. And there's a particular issue now for those of you that are doctors out there. Then you've heard of something called hemophagocytic lymphocytosis. Worst case scenario. Secondary, acidic lymphohistiocytosis. That's something that you want to keep in mind. I'll walk you through that when the time is right. Hopefully, now at this point, you understand that coronavirus has been around for a while. Common cold, but when it's zoonotic, kind of scary. Because zoonotic, I mean literally zoo animals. Here, it jumped from the animal to us. So, what are the things that you want to do to prevent this? Wear a mask. I know it's hard to come by. A makeshift mask. Wash your hands with water and soap. 20 seconds is the recommendation. That's a long time. Be disciplined. Be disciplined. When you go to work if you need to. Or you come back from work. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Soap, 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 soap. 20 seconds. If you cannot find soap and water, obviously hand sanitizer. Next, when you cough and sneeze, don't go... Or, <coughs> you have fingers. Through those fingers, the respiratory droplets might then spread. Go into the crook of your elbow or your sleeve. <coughs> 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 
less chance that the respiratory droplets from moving forward. Be disciplined. Be considerate of your dying neighbor. Those respiratory droplets, like a hot air balloon, can travel two feet. I mean, excuse me, six feet or two meters. That's a long way, actually. Those are things that you can do quickly to prevent it. Next. We're going to move into more prevention. And uh, what I really would like for you to do is... Uh, Those of you that are interested in making a difference, which is all of you. Epidemiologic studies. Now, I'll give you a bunch of websites. And in these websites, we need to take surveys. In these surveys, we figure out. These are situation reports that you may want to go into, especially if you want to make a difference. Now, these situation reports, there's five different ones. I'm not going to go through every single one, but there's five early investigations. If you want to know more, here's the email address to get in touch with WHO so that your community can participate in surveys so that we can learn more about the virus in terms of transmission. How dangerous is it? What, what are the severity? What are traces in terms of laboratory, in terms of clinical tracing, and so on and so forth? The one that seems to be uh, gaining quite, quite a bit of popularity, ones that people are participating, it's called the FFX, the first few COVID-19 cases, contract transmission. These are all surveys and studies that each country must do so that we can learn more about the virus so that we can then better combat it, period. In other words... It's about educating yourself about thy enemy. The more that we know about the enemy and how it, it, it is attacking us, the more that we can then strategically figure out how to beat it. So these are all just, I'm just flying through this because they're giving you the details about the surveys that are then put out with all these different countries. I mean, we're looking at 180, 200. I mean, talk about every single country basically on this planet, every continent, except Antarctica. You want to get away from the virus altogether, maybe take a cruise down to Antarctica. It's the only continent thus far that has not been affected. Okay, so clinical presentation. Earlier we said that the incubation period here for COVID-19 or SARS version 2 is 2 to 14 days. We're going to look for fever, dry cough, fatigue, and tiredness. These are the percentages in which we would then see this in our patient. So fever, almost all of them, and you've heard that before. So if you're not running a fever, you probably do not have COVID-19. Dry cough. And the reason for that is because where the infection affects the lung, I showed you the lung with peripheral consolidation, or excuse me, peripheral opacification called ground glass appearance. And because it's probably the interstitium that's being affected, the type of cough that you're going to have is called dry. Now, it, could it then affect an, an inflammatory process in which it could then cause a productive type of cough? Sure, but that's not good news. Fatigue and tiredness. Our patient had a hard time walking from the bedroom to the kitchen. Could there be sputum production? Sputum is the phlegm that you're coming up with. You could, sure. But as a doctor, you will not usually induce that sputum. Shortness of breath. This is when it goes into severe infection. So that consolidation, I mean that, that opacification may then result in consolidation, which may means that the lung disease is getting worse. Now why is it the lung? We'll get to that in a second. Sore throat, 10 to 15 percent, headache, much less. Myalgia, arthrologia means muscle and bone pain. Chills, and then also could affect the GI system. So you got vomiting, diarrhea that could occur. Tightness, pleuritic chest pain. Now these are much lower in terms of clinical investigation or presentation investigation would be our images that i showed you for example the chest x-ray giving you the opacification peripherally and on the ct we call that ground glass i've shown you pictures on that now from here let's talk about the pathogenesis now reason that this is important 
is because we need to understand how this virus moves into us. That may then become pandemic in the future. You can pretty much guarantee that it will just the way that we behave and that we lead our lives. So what do we know about the virus itself? It's called Corona. In Latin, Corona means a crown. So literally, the virus is wearing a crown. Now, these extensions that you see here on electron microscopy, this then represents the spike. We're going to spend a lot of time on these spikes, the crown otherwise. It's called Corona. Now, there is a difference spikes of SARS version 2, the bat, the pangolin, theories out there hasn't been confirmed yet, versus SARS version 1 with the cam, uh, excuse me, with the uh, civet. The difference is with this spike. Unbelievable as to how this spike will behave. This that you see here, the crown, is the spike. We're going to spend time here, so I'm going to be technical with the spike here. And the reason for that, as I said, is because the vaccines that are being developed now, there might be approximately six different vaccines that are in the works at this point. There is no single vaccine to treat it at this point. Anything that you're finding on the web that claims to be WHO certified vaccines is fraud. Up until today. Moving forward, well, hopefully we'll get something, but we're not there yet. We're still trying to understand the darn virus. We're going to begin by looking at that spike. That spike is then called an S protein. That spike is called an S protein. That S protein has two different subdivisions called S1 and S2. And that's important. Now, keep in mind that this virus, when it's gotten into us, it's going to affect the respiratory system. Why? Why is it affecting the respiratory system in such commonality? The reason or frequency is because this spike identifies, identifies in our lungs with something called alveolar epithelium. In the alveolar epithelium, that means the little air sacs that we have in our lungs in which it has gas exchange. In that alveolar epithelium, that's way down in the lung, we have these things called type 2 pneumocytes. The type 2 pneumocytes are very important for our alveoli to remain alive. Unfortunately, for us, because of the virus, the type 2 pneumocyte that has a receptor called angiotensin-converting enzyme type 2 receptor. Unbelievably, this virus has an unbelievable affinity. In other words, cohesiveness or attraction of that spike to attach to, um, from now on I'll call it ACE2, the ACE2 receptors on what? The alveolar epithelium and hence the respiratory sh issue of dry cough resulting in inflammatory process thus resulting in a fever is such a common, 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 common presentation with COVID type 19. Unbelievable. Now, we've got to talk a little bit more because some of you will develop vaccines. This S spike has a cleavage site. What's a cleavage site mean? It means that it has a location. And on that location of that, it's a trimeric S spike. And it has a cleavage site. In other words, it has a site in which it's waiting for an enzyme that we have in our respiratory system that allows for the spike, the corona, to then fuse with the alveolar epithelium. The name of that enzyme is called furin. That you have to know moving forward. Furin. Furin is the enzyme that identifies the cleavage site on the S spike to then cleave it into S1 and S2. S1 and S2. What I mean by S is the spike. It allows for attachment, fusion, and then once this darn virus fuses with the alveolar epithelium, guess what it's going to do? It's going to dump its content into the cell. It's going to dump its content into the cell. And because it's a positive sense, single-stranded RNA, it'll immediately start forming messenger RNA, 
proteins proliferate, replicate, divide, 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 divide. Oh my goodness gracious, it has found heaven in us, human beings. And then we pass it from human to human to human to human through these hot air balloons called respiratory droplets. For how long? For how far? Ha! Six feet, two meters. That's a long way. Most of your patients are what? Asymptomatic. You may not even know that you have it, but you're passing it. But this is how it's getting into you. It came from an animal. You have other proteins. You got E, envelope, M, membrane, N, neurocapsin. May play a role in terms of vaccines. All required for pathogenicity. In other words, it contributes to the tropism of this virus. By tropism, we're meaning the infectivity of the virus as it gets stronger. Unbelievable. Continue discu discussion. What's the structure? It's a corona. It's a little cartoon. We'll focus on that S spike. It's comprised of how many different subtypes? Two. S1 and S2. Has a cleavage site. Where does it love to go? The alveolar epithelium. Who works on that cleavage site? It's called furin. Located where? In the respiratory system. Allows for breaking up the S spike into S1 and S2. The S1 will then facilitate the entry of the virus and into the human alveolar epithelial cell, the host cell, so that it can undergo replication and so forth. It's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's unbelievable. Here's a nuclear capsid. So once it gets in, it'll then shed the envelope. It'll then release the RNA from the capsid right in to the host cell. Isn't that a movie called Alien? And here you go. Quickly here, take a look. S spike. This, let's say we call this a host cell. This is the virus. You breathe it in. Here comes the virus. With its spikes. Furin will get in. Furin will get in. It will then cleave the site psych, psych of the spike. Then dividing it into S1 and S2. S will then allow for the spiking and fusing of the virus into the host cell through the membrane. It will uncoat. Go through replication. It will then undergo polymerase. It will undergo messenger RNA. It will then form its proteins. These are all different sites in which drugs work or targets potentially where drugs could work to defeat the enemy in this case COVID now viruses share common behavior and because of that there are drugs that are out there called retinavir lopinavir the suffix is navir n-a-v-i-r navir these are protease inhibitors these are protease inhibitors. Proteases will break up the polyprotein. Polyprotein means these large proteins. This RNA virus has used the host cell to produce through its messenger. The protease is good for the virus, bad for us. Therefore, the theory is, the theory is, not, nothing's been proven that these anti-HIV human immunodeficiency virus drugs that are protease inhibitors called lopinavir, ritinavir may then inhibit the protease so therefore you're not able to assemble the virus in theory sounds fantastic the protease inhibitor works well with HIV has not been proven to work for or against COVID-19. But yet, it's been given. Antimalarial drugs, parasite, or excuse me, a protozoa, anti hydroxychloroquine to combat malaria has antiviral properties. Once again, nothing's been proven that it actually works, but yet is given and claim that maybe it reduces the viral or RNA load. Still working on it, all anecdotal at this point. Still too early. Fill out the surveys, figure out what that means. 
Those surveys need to be figured out, given by the government, then to the hospital, and then communities in which it's being filled up, so that we understand more about the virus, so that we can then be educated, so that we know how to combat, and then most importantly, prevent any of this from hopefully happening again. And when such a pandemic occurs again, we're equipped to deal with it. We're equipped to deal with it. Not a joke. Furin. Behaves like MERS, but not exactly. Behaves like SARS, but not exactly. For those of you that are doctors out there, you've heard of septilicin. You've heard of septilicin because that's what furin is. Furin is an enzyme that is required by the COVID to break up that spike so that it becomes more tropic. In other words, more infective. You doctors know about it because you've heard of PCSK9 inhibitors. Completely different place, but you've heard of subtilicin. That's what furin is. There's a cleavage site that I've been referring to. S1 is required early on to get the virus in. S2 will continue the process to dump the RNA into the host cell. Influenza seems to have that cleavage site. SARS version 1 with the Asian palm civet and the bat doesn't seem to have it. SARS version 1 doesn't have it. Our current version 2, the COVID, does. So in other words, the, th the, the, the targets, the potential target of the spike in which maybe you could block the spike or you could inhibit the modification of the spike so it doesn't fuse into the membrane could be targets of therapy, correct? So those are things that are then worked upon. And those furin and such, man, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So we have a respiratory epithelium, could be in the GI tract. Hence, is it possible that you may then have diarrhea and vomiting with uh, COVID? Sure you can. And the reason for that, once again, is because we have ACE. Two, angiotensin converting enzyme two receptors in such places, the theory is, but definitely in the respiratory alveolar epithelium. So there's a spike that we're referring to. With that spike, if you were to block it, then it wouldn't be able to bind to the receptor or maybe perhaps block the receptor itself. These are drugs that currently we use for HIV. So you inhibit the fusion, it's called infuvuretide. And then the one that blocks the receptor is called Marivarac. So these are all drugs that are out there to combat other type of viruses that have similar behavior. But, like human beings, just like any type of animal, just because you kind of look alike and you may then have certain similar features or behavior, doesn't mean that you're exactly alike. Each one of us is unique. Each virus is unique. But, you may be, be able to extrapolate that information so that you can figure out as to whether or not, hmm, could this drug, could this vaccine be used for that particular virus? In this case, that's exactly what we're doing. Remember, <clears throat> the biobarker or the marker that we look for when you have cardiac disease, especially if you have myocardial infarction, it's called troponin I, and that's what that is. But with the disease, it might mask arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation that may occur in the elderly people. Atrial fib, AFib, elderly people, if you mask arrhythmia, that's not good. Depression of the myocardial or increased demand and depression of the unless you're going into heart failure, and then exacerbation of the acute coronary syndrome.
things with orids. But at this point, we're going to keep focused and only look at COVID. And with COVID, remember, it's the peripheral sides that will be affected, called ground glass. Now, if you find this on a bone marrow, this arrow, this is severe critical, and this is for you ducks. Keep in mind that if the infection, a viral infection, which is overwhelming immune response, they might get so bad, it may result in a tipping point of what we call secondary hemophagocytic lymphocytosis. Literally now, the macrophages in the bone marrow may then start causing phagocytosis of the cells within the bone marrow. Dangerous as all get out. Now, the labs for this, just to make sure that your docs are aware of this. Now, remember, you will find this in critical. That's only, only at this point. Maybe 2%, 3%, maybe 4% of our population. And that's changing every single day. Most of our patients will be mild. Just to be clear, this is critical. Also known as a cytokine storm syndrome. And then HLH stands for hemophagocytic lymphocytosis. As of the 2004 criteria, you need 5 of the 8. Low natural killer cells. I showed you the bone marrow. Hypertriglycidemia. We have CD25, which is basically interleukin-2 receptor. Fevers that are elevated, hyperferritinemia, and splenomegaly. That's for HLH. The cytopenias may be there. As I said, just keep that in mind if we start getting into critical issues. Finally, we're going to end today by making sure that we know that this is a, overall, statistically, a mild issue. Most of the patients will be asymptomatic. The reason that we're talking about social distancing, the reason that we're talking about self-quarantining, quarantining, is because if you have it and, you, and then you pass it through the respiratory droplets, that you may then be affecting someone who's immunocompromised. And there are millions of people that are taking drugs that are called immunomodulators. For example, for rheumatoid arthritis, maybe lupus. These patients need to continue taking those drugs, but these drugs will then cause, on purpose, the immune system to be depressed with those diseases. On top of that, if you pass on the COVID to such patients, you may then cause that patient to go into tipping point of severe infection and perhaps put them no return. Hence, the steps that we're taking in such a drastic manner not to be taken lightly. It's a pandemic. We will win the war, but education is everything. In pregnancy, up to date, current, we don't know of any confirmed vertical transmission, pregnant lady who has COVID, and these numbers obviously are rising every single day, but we do not have any confirmation that it could be vertical transmission. What I mean by that is that as the neonate is making its way out of the mama, is it possible that the pregnant woman could then pass on the virus to the fetus and neonate? We don't have evidence of that yet. Could it occur? We're working on that, number one. Number two, we don't have confirmation of the virus being in breast milk. Could it happen? Yes. Always exercise caution. So now with that said, diagnosis. What's this test that we're looking at? We use something called the nucleic acid amplification test. You're going to do a nasopharyngeal swab, NAT, N-A-A-T. The type of NAT, nucleic acid amplification test, is called an RT-PCR. RT stands for reverse transcriptase polymer chain reaction. It's an RNA virus. The issue of COVID and then taking necessary steps, number one. Number two, those images that I gave you with our patient Bernie in which there was a pacification that I showed you peripherally. Is it possible that the RT-PCR may then come back to be negative? Negative, meaning, ha! The patient 
didn't have the disease according to the test. Could it be possible? Yes. And that's a little scary. So the fact that you get a false negative, but that's why you do the images. And the doctor that you're going to now at this point is well versed and well educated and has a high sense of acuity to know as to whether or not clinically you have COVID or not, has run the appropriate test, has asked you to come into the hospital like we did with patient Bernie. You continue doing the test because the images show that there's something going on. So false negative is part of reality. But the thing is, you're not going to go in unless you're absolutely asked to do so. Because how selfish are you to take this test when you're not showing any symptoms and most likely you will recover completely on your own because your immune system is strong enough. How selfish is that of you? Think about that. So false negative is a possibility. And then the doctor finds that on the images that there's those opacifications and ground glass. Do we continue with the test? Yes. And ultimately, could it become positive? Yes, it could. But remember that your main thing is to make sure that you maintain your immune system. In other words, eat properly. Sleep properly. Do not stress. Remain calm. Remain cool. The days will go on. Our patients are scared. Turn to the Lord if you need to. He rules all. Perhaps. He is the only one who will pass judgment. And then ultimately, when you're feeling weak and you're feeling scared, and those of us that feel oppressed, turn to a source. Turn to something in which it provides you with strength with inner fortitude, so that as we come out of this, that we will be that much stronger, so that the next time we have to then go into battle against an invisible enemy as such, that we will not fall, we will not feel crippled, and we will not be scared, and we'll rise to the occasion and do what we need to so that we will win as a society. Community centered medicine is what we need to be doing so that our system does not feel overwhelmed we help each other we talk to each other and we no longer hopefully are so selfish that ultimately nature itself takes it upon its shoulders to show us otherwise i wish you well i wish you the best I don't really know whether or not I have COVID or not, but I know there are people out there that need help. I'm not going to get tested. That's me, personally. So you do what you think is right. Think about that. And ultimately, I wish you the best. But with that said, I'm going to bid you all a good day, a good evening, good morning. And uh, man, what a mess. But faith and hope will carry us through. Bye.